Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon and good evening from uh, wherever you are uh, in, in uh, around the world. Um, it's 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 a pleasure for me and a privilege. I'm chairing the launch of the UK uh, ISAP chapter, and um, so far we've 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 got about 620 730 people registered for this webinar and from 70 uh, countries. So welcome to uh, all of you. We've also got uh, some videos um, uh, from, from a number of countries on the welcome of the launch, which we are going to show uh, later on. A little bit about uh, uh, the ISAP UK chapter, which was set up uh, recently. We have a, an advisory board uh, coming from across uh, diverse backgrounds covering the whole of the United Kingdom and we have a website so I will not say too much and uh, you can go through the UK chapter website and all the details uh, would be there but suffice to say that the UK chapter sits uh, at the moment with uh, Middlesex University uh, and hosted uh, by uh, the Drug and Alcohol Research Centre and one of our speakers, Professor Nick Beach, who you will see on, on, the, on the program, will say a little bit more about this. Okay, our key objective is aligned with uh, UK, with uh, ISAP, uh, with Global ISAP, and, uh, and we promote knowledge, research, advice, and participation on, on key policies at uh, national levels and international levels, wherever that's uh, relevant and we share good practice and promote training and uh, promote the competencies of workforce in, in the field of substance use disorders. Um, we, our plan for, for, the, for, for, for this year is around quality and family. We've already had before the launch of ISAP, we had a launch on, on quality assurance, which is a couple of weeks ago, which was led by uh, Annette and it, it Dale Pereira. Membership, as you all know, um, and for those who are new to, to, to ISA, membership is free. I would encourage all of you uh, to uh, register and join uh, ISA. Um, as you would have seen, we, we have a, a very well laid down program from uh, people uh, who are quite influential on the topics which they're going to cover and international speakers as well. And uh, what I'm going to do is introduce um, each speaker and they then will, will say a little bit about themselves. We are quite uh, tight on time, we're constrained by time, so we need to stick to time. So before uh, I go on to introduce the speakers, I just, a few uh, housekeeping stuff which I want to cover on using this platform. Uh, you will, I would encourage you to use the icons to write your questions and, or comments or suggestions that will be picked up uh, 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 later on. And we will have a question and, uh, and answer session. You will also notice that uh, all your microphone will be on mute and, and cameras also uh, will, 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 not be, uh, will not be there, will not be available. Um, as I said, because of, of time constraint, I am now going to go straight uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, and uh, Nick, Professor Nick Beach, who is the uh, Deputy uh, I get it right, the uh, Deputy Dean for Middlesex University, uh, and you will have five five minutes to do your presentations uh, and the link with Middlesex University. Um, also just want to add is that there will be a little bell that will ring uh, about one minute before the end of your presentation, just to give you a little uh, a warning. So over to you, uh, Professor Nick Beach. Thanks very much, Raj, and it's a delight uh, to be here. My name is uh, Nick Beach and I'm, I'm actually the Vice-Chancellor of the University. Um, and on learning a bit about ISAP, I have to say I was already excited, but I am really excited and delighted to have this engagement, this involvement with you. And your aims, it seems to me, is a, is a really holistic vision in which you're concerned with prevention and treatment and recovery and with developing a, a genuinely knowledgeable community. And that resonates so strongly 
for us in Middlesex and what we're trying to do. And so I'm delighted that we can be part of that, the support for that, but also for us, uh, it's an opportunity to learn and to be part of that learning network. So thank you for this opportunity and I'm very delighted to be involved. I'll just say a couple of words about why I hope that's relevant at Middlesex uh, um, and then open it up for the other speakers. We have a, a relatively new strategy and the headline for us is knowledge into action. We are really focused on the sorts of learning that mean that people transform their lives and the sort of research that has genuine impact and makes a difference and linking these two things together to ourselves being a learning community. And that means that we need to be really diverse and to be diverse and inclusive, not in a way that means that people have to conform to our stereotypes or our ideals, but that we ourselves are very clear that we are trying to learn as we go and adapt as we go to the diversity of views. And one of the things that I've been learning about USAP has been that kind of very professional approach, which isn't about a, a dictatorial or single answer, but is much more about a holistic and a human approach to doing things, which is, which is fabulous. We have three um, key aims, which are about equity and improvements in health and well-being, inclusive socioeconomic development, and uh, community and, and environmental sustainability. And I have to say the aims of USAP uh, really uh, could fit into all three of our core aims as a university and really integrate across them. Because of course, the more that we can get people enabled to participate in society, enabled to participate economically, and uh, to live healthy lives, the better you end up in a virtuous cycle of those, those three things. We're quite a big community. We have 42,000 students around the world, three different um, centers, one in London, one in Mauritius, one in Dubai. Uh, so roughly half of our students are, are, are in London. But the crucial thing for us is, particularly in London, we are about social mobility and we're about that inclusivity. So over 40% of our undergraduate students were eligible for free school meals. That's that they come from areas of socioeconomic um, deprivation. To get those people into university is just fabulous. They come out of university and work in healthcare, they work in social care, they make a real difference professionally, but also the ones that do other subjects. One in seven becomes an entrepreneur. And this just shows you the real drive that these people have to change their society, to change their community. And we as a staff group are delighted to work with them. So thank you for the opportunity to be involved. I hope that our ethic, our ethos, and our approach to learning and inquiry, but to do so that in a way that makes a real difference, will support your work. And I'm sure there's much that we can learn from you. I know there's some fabulous people um, lined up now uh, with yeah. Joanna and Brian and Carmel, who I know very well, and Ed, who is uh, absolutely super. So I think you're gonna have a fabulous time today. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Beach. Could I move on to uh, Joanna uh, Travis Roberts, who's the chief executive of ISAP, and will actually tell us more about ISAP within the global context and uh, and where Middlesex fit in. I forgot to mention that these sessions are being recorded and they will be available in, in a few weeks' time. Sorry, Joanna. Can't hear you. Does that work better? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so thank you very much, Raj, and thank you to ICE UK for inviting me to be part of um, this really exciting occasion. To uh, I know that you have already been working, but to have this moment to sort of commemorate the launch, I think it is fantastic. And um, thank you to ICE UK for putting together such an interesting panel of speakers for later on in the session, um, which I'm really looking forward to listening to. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about ISAP. Um, we are an international membership organisation that's really focused on the development, support and representation of a connected, trained, knowledgeable and effective workforce in this field. And um, as Nick said, we, we sort of go the full spectrum. So we, we include prevention treatment and recovery support. We have over 20,000 members around the world. And we include all elements of the workforce, all pieces of the puzzle. So that's everything from 
volunteers, family members, all the way through to people who've made this their lifelong research career. You know, it's, there's so many elements and facets to this workforce and we want to be able to bring them all together and really represent them and acknowledge them as a workforce. Um, we are supported by INL, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, and Brian will be talking to you shortly. And we enjoy an excellent close working relationship with the international organizations and the other INL partners. So we can not only provide things for our members ourselves, but really connect people to the things that other key organizations are doing. Um, we deliver our work in three ways. So we have a digital element, which is has a wealth of networking opportunities, resources, knowledge, tools, training, learning um, on the website, which you can have a look at. We have events such as this webinar and conferences that happened in person and online and our national chapters, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, the national chapters are really key and an essential part of our work because they really allow us to meet and connect with key organisations that are there at the country level to make sure that we represent what the members need within that country, within their context, within their culture, and their reference points. Um, we currently have 24, and as I said, it's a real privilege to be launching ISAP UK today. We are obviously delighted to be working with the Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at Middlesex University um, as the host organisation for ISAP UK. They're incredibly well placed as a credible and expert organisation and well respected in terms of the activities that they are doing. So I think it's, an, it's a really great collaboration and we're looking forward to bringing the sort of expertise and the, some of the knowledge from, from that collaboration to our global members. Um, by our National Chapters Coordinator, Kirsty Fitzpatrick. We've already been working closely with ISAP UK for some time now. And um, as you said, there's a fantastic board who really bring a wealth of different knowledge and experience to the table. And we look forward to continue to share and work together as ISAP UK continues to go from strength to strength. Um, as Raj said, there's lots of information about ISAP and ISAP UK on the website and you can join there for free. And you'll also be able to watch this or send this webinar to other people so that they can see the recording. And um, we look forward to working with ISAP UK. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Joanna. As I said, anybody who wants questions, please use the icons to, to uh, ask your questions and suggestions or, or comments. Um, I'll now pass on to Brian, Brian Morales who's the branch chief, counter narcotic office of global programs and policies for INL, and also one of the main funders for the Colombo plan UTC training programs. And Brian, over, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Raj. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, colleagues and friends from the UK and around the world, good morning from Washington DC and the United States Department of State. I'm honored and humbled to say a few words uh, on this momentous occasion of ISAP's uh, UK chapter launch. ISAP was born from a movement in 2015 that affirms that everyone has a role to play in addressing substance use. Of course, clinicians are protagonists in, in that workforce, but we also find our workforce in the university, private sector, NGO sector, um, government sector, whether you're a parent, a friend, or simply a concerned citizen, the question is not whether you should join ISAP, but in how many ways can you contribute as an ISAP member to addressing substance use in your community. ISAP can offer tools, enhance knowledge and skills, offer networking, and it brings a message of unity of purpose. ISAP offers a message of optimism. We recognize substance use disorders as a chronic relapsing disease, and we have the tools to address that challenge. It's logical that the UK and the US have taken such a leadership role in cultivating this organization. Together, our countries produce a large body of scientific literature in the addiction field, we have prominent global leaders in the fields of prevention, treatment, and recovery. And we have a history of contributing to foreign assistance and building partnerships with low and middle income countries to strengthen their public health systems. Today, as a champion of ISAP, looking from across the other side of the Atlantic, I want to emphasize what an incredible organization our British colleagues have built. The world's largest professional society of 20,000 members in over 160 countries, 
a network of more than 20 national chapters which have gained prominence and recognition by their national governments, the launch of ISIP's own journal on addiction science in partnership with Charles University in Prague, a website that provides news, serves as professional development network, and offers access to over 100 curriculum manuals. And recently, the website has started offering online self-led courses, which will be complemented with instructor-led courses in the coming months. And a conference, or convention really, each year which brings together thousands of practitioners from around the world. Over the past years, ISAP has held these global conferences in Thailand, Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, Austria, and next May, uh, we hope to see you all in the United Arab Emirates for the next major global event. In five years, the organization has enjoyed a meteoric rise and it appears fixed on its trajectory of continued growth. The source of ISAP's remarkable achievements is simple. It's the amazing talent that the organization has been able to recruit. At its inception, Jeff Lee's leadership laid the foundation for the organization's prosperity and growth. Jack Tonkin has painstakingly built feature after feature on the website from day one, making it always more dynamic and more engaging. And while ISAP has a great team to support the website and the national chapter development, you'd be surprised in how much is accomplished by so few. But the greatest credit goes to Joanna Tratis Roberts, who with the uncommon combination of managerial skills, diplomatic tact, and strategic vision, has consistently expanded the organization's reach while ensuring it keeps pace within its resource constraints. The US government is proud to support ISIP in its global work. Today, as we mark the establishment of the United Kingdom's chapter, I request our British colleagues not only to enhance your work in the UK through the ISIP national chapter, but we also invite you to join us in collaborating in third countries, particularly across Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, where public health systems need so much support and the nature of substance use disorders remains misunderstood by many. Through ISAP, we can professionalize the global addiction workforce, promote universal quality assurance standards, and combat the stigma, discrimination, and abuses that so many with the disease are facing around the world. We're confident that this 21st century organization is poised to make a transformational impact in addressing the disease of substance use disorders, uh, which is as old as humanity itself. Uh, and we are simply thrilled to undertake this work with our friends in the UK. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Brian, for this uh, inspiring uh, presentation. And it is true, we need to look at the, uh, we'll encourage people to look at the ISAP website of all the work that's been done. And to date now, I think we've got over 2,000 members now uh, which is a very, very big achievement for ISAP. Thank you again, Brian. Um, I'll now move on to uh, Carmel Clancy. Carmel, are you with us now? I am indeed, Raj. Hello and thank you. Um, I do have a few slides and I know my colleagues have very kindly agreed uh, to throw those up for me. Um, you'll be um, You'll be protected from seeing me on camera because ultimately my camera doesn't seem to be compatible at the moment. So my apologies that I'm not on camera, but hopefully my slides will suffice. And I would like to just add my thanks and my gratitude for the opportunity of speaking with everybody today and my excitement also that this has happened. I've been uh, sort of part of the journey of, of ISA really probably from its beginning, as Brian has said, and our paths have been crossing all over the place because I also have the privilege at the moment of being the president of the International Nurses Society in Addictions, which is called INSA, um, and INSA and INL and ISA are all working together to really look at how we can mobilize nursing and nursing workforce and specifically. So I'm, I'm really pleased that ISA UK has now started and on behalf of the board, I've been asked just to share just a few thoughts really uh, from the board and to acknowledge obviously this really exciting moment for us and and of course uh, working at Middlesex it's a privilege as well so if we could go to the first slide for me um, what I, I, I think it's impossible not to mention uh, at the moment obviously the last couple of years um, and I think that the reason I, I flag this is because it's one of the reasons I think that we, particularly in the UK, are anxious to come together even more so because we know, and Dame Carol Black's uh, recent report has reminded us that over the last number of years, although certainly the UK has been a leader and continues to be so, it has 
uh, slipped slightly um, in terms of its its rankings, I would say. Uh, and that is, you know, that's a shame. But hopefully with Dame Carol Black's report, we're going to, to reposition ourselves. And I think ISAP offers us as a UK chapter a huge opportunity of bringing colleagues together who often have felt that they've been dispersed and sort of isolated. So we're really quite excited that we have a sort of multi-agency, multi-discipline group that are um, looking right across our four countries um, in terms of England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So we're really quite excited, as I say, about the possibilities. And particularly because, uh, you know, we have obviously the pandemic that we've all been experiencing, but we, uh, I would suggest, and I've heard this said in, in other places, that we have parallel pandemics. And if you go to the next slide, I might explain what I mean by that. And of course, you know, even though perhaps substance use disorder, if you go to the next slide for me, if you, substance use disorder in itself may not meet the strict criteria of, of a pandemic. However, I'm sure all of us who have been touched by that one way or the other would recognize the ubiquitous nature of substance use and that it does cross every country, every boundary, every social uh, level. Nobody seems to be protected from that. And in some respects, we, we are out of control and we are in crisis. And Brian's pointing us to various other aspects of the world who are in need of support uh, is, is a really good example of that. And of course, that's been compounded over the last couple of years because of the uh, COVID-19. And this is kind of a demonstration or illustration of how and where we are and potentially that even though we may felt that we've made some inroads and certainly we have we have a long way to go and probably we've been set back uh, considerably because of the pandemic um, and that of course attention has been taken away perhaps from our particularly marginalized communities when in actual fact we should be putting more energy to them so again ICEP, ICEP chapter the coming together of our our, our different agencies and different workers is going to be more, more important now than ever. Um, if we go to the next slide, and so, you know, least we forget, um, I think it's always important for us to, to recognize that the burden and the burden of, of disease uh, and the, the treatment needs uh, seem to be never ending. Um, and, you know, this is, if you haven't uh, caught this one, uh, I would, it's an open access. It's a really nice paper to remind us of why we are in the business, so to speak, or why we are keen to come together and look at this issue. Um, the next slide is a little bit a little bit fussy, but it does kind of give you an indication of that this is not just one area that's impacted. If you look right across um, the disease, you know, sort of spectrum um, and the burden, it, it, it hits absolutely everything. Um, and really, you know, often people assume that substance use is, is something that's not their problem or something they don't have to worry about, whereas I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted, uh, particularly on this webinar, that that is not the case, but that it actually touches absolutely every aspect of the health and social care arena. And we do need to do something. And if we're going to turn the dial uh, in, in a positive way uh, against this burden, then clearly uh, addressing substance use uh, in a far reaching way is, 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 is a demand, uh, if not a necessity. Um, if we go to the next slide, just a little bit about why we particularly uh, in the UK wanted this chapter and certainly are very excited to have it. We believe that you know, there is certainly not just in the UK, but globally a workforce waiting to be mobilized. Um, you know, there's the importance of working globally because there's so much that we learn from each other, but recognizing, and I think this is one of the strengths of, of ISAP, is that by having national chapters, it allows us also to come together to look at our differences at a national level. And we all know, even down to local communities, um, that, you know, languages can be different on how drugs are portrayed, uh, different types of profiles of drug use is happening. So we do need to understand some of the uh, more local issues in our community, but certainly we recognize that there is a massive overlap in terms of our experience. And I think if we can leverage the global community to help us understand what we're doing at a local level, then I think of ultimately we will start to move that dial. So much is already happening uh, in the UK. You've heard my colleagues already say they've been working with us. We have uh, really tried to get things together. We've been very fortunate at Middlesex with uh, our colleagues actually in Valencia University to do some work with the Columba Plan, which is being funded through the INL, which is a massive educational program. It's an amazing piece of work. I, I really uh, uh, recommend that you check it out um, because they're now starting to move all of the curricula that was being delivered face-to-face -face into 
an online uh, mode um, and we're piloting that with them at the moment. Fantastic piece of work and it just means that we're going to be able to reach larger and greater communities, hopefully with, with, with greater access. Um, we're also looking at the issue of global certification. Standards are incredibly important, we all know that. There is an absence of certification, certainly for the broader uh, workforce. We have some in, in nursing, uh, which is really more North America and Canada. We have some in medicine and we have a little bit around drug counsellors, but collectively we, that is not where it needs to be. Um, and so we at INSA are looking at a global nursing certification uh, and we're just starting to look and scope out that work. And our own multidisciplinary, multi-agency and cross-faculty we've, we've referred to, the home of DARC will be the ideal home, we believe, for ISAP UK. We already, within our university, have a huge focus uh, within this, this, this field. I'm just thrilled that our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nick Beach, was able to come and, and, and help us launch this event. We absolutely have his 150%, I would suggest, uh, support. So I, I think the home for uh, the ISAP UK chapter is very secure at the moment, uh, which I'm really pleased about. And I know my colleagues within DARC are, given that we do already have a multidisciplinary group working with us. And we're so pleased that we have so many visiting um, uh, members that are now on the board, as I say, representing the four countries. So it, it's all looking quite bright and, and beautiful, so to speak. I think we're, we're really getting ourselves launched up. Um, and I hope that as time moves on, perhaps after our first year of operations, we'll be able to come back and give you even more report on how we've been uh, moving that dial, as I say, and, and penetrating this particularly difficult, this difficult area. So I think if uh, we go to the last slide, I think I'm possibly uh, there. There's just a couple of details if you wanted to reach out. Please feel free, of course, to use my, my uh, personal uh, work email address, um, but also if you wanted to check out the Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, uh, you will be able to click on that, that uh, link. But thank you very much, Raj and colleagues, and on behalf of, uh, of uh, ISAP UK, uh, we're so, so thrilled uh, to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Carmel, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, linking uh, INL with INSA and ISAP and all the work that's been done. Um, I will now move on to Dr. Ed Day, who is a UK drug recovery champion uh, for, uh, from the University of Birmingham. Um, so over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Ed Day. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to, um, to join you here from my uh, clinic in uh, Solihull in the West Midlands, where I'm in the midst of a, uh, a, a drug treatment clinic. I'm I'm Ed Day. I'm, I'm a consultant psychiatrist working in the yes. in the NHS. I've worked in the addictions field for more than 20 years. I'm also a clinical academic. I'm delighted to be invited to to say a few words at the launch of the of the UK chapter of ISAP. And I I can't think of a better place um, for it to be cited than than uh, with colleagues at the University of Middlesex and the, and the Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. Fantastic uh, partnership there. Um, as I say, I've, I've worked in the field for, for, for more than 20 years, and I was appointed uh, UK government national recovery champion uh, on a seconded role in May 2019. And this was a role that um, was uh, enshrined in the 2017 drug strategy, and really, uh, as far as I could see, had two key aims. One was to ensure that the government delivered evidence-based interventions for, for people with substance use disorders, and the second was to try to make sure that everyone in the field works together to achieve those aims. Um, soon after taking the role, uh, Dame Carol Black, who you've heard mentioned already, um, was commissioned by the UK government to start the first of two reviews into the state of, of drugs and drug treatment in, in the UK. And I've very much taken an active part uh, as an advisor in the, in the second of those reports. Um, if you're not from the UK or you, you haven't seen them, I'm sure you have if you're in the UK, they're worth reading because the second report, came, the, the one about treatment services, came out earlier this year. And sadly, I would echo what, what Carmel said, that, um, that unfortunately, after 10 years of growth, we, we've more recently had 10 years of cuts to our treatment sector. And from a, a real world-beating place, we, we find ourselves now... I sometimes use the term on our knees. It feels a bit like that now because um, services have taken such a hit from this. Um, the, the, 
Dan Carroll outlined the problems that have occurred. So one is lack of funding, but what, a second is also chopping and changing in commissioning practices and lack of continuity of care, all of which cut across key therapeutic aims of all of us, which is which is building therapeutic alliance and, 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 and consistency, um, which have really been impacted by those changes. And it also acknowledges that the workforce in the UK has taken a huge hit. There's been decreasing numbers of practitioners. A lot of our skilled practitioners have left the field. Um, there's been big disruption to training pathways for different professional groups, psychiatrists, nurses, psychologists, which have meant that uh, the pathways to replenish those roles have gone. And we've also seen big cuts in training and clinical supervision um, for services. And all of that on top of a lack of national qualifications, uh, nationally recognized qualifications as, as a substance use practitioner. Um, and I think uh, we sit at a slight uh, knife edge now because the, the report has delivered all those punches, but we wait to see whether post COVID-19, the government will fund the necessary changes to, to the system. Um, thinking of ISA, I, I, I really fall strongly in line with the aims and, 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 the, and the principles that have been outlined so far. Um, I, I think of thinking of the three areas. Um, I, I'm a strong believer that we need to facilitate all pathways to recovery. There's no one right route to, to, to doing it. And of course, substance use spans a full spectrum from abstinence, from recreational or, or non-problematic use through the development of problems and obviously to at the sort of tip of the iceberg um, dependence and substance use disorder. And, and with that range comes a need for a full range of intervention strategies. So prevention was flagged up in Dan Carroll's report, but really I don't feel given the, 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 um, pre uh, the, 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 the level of um, detail that it really merits because because prevention is an underused and underrepresented element of most treatment systems. There's good reasons why, largely because governments often won't fund uh, interventions that don't yield outcomes for many years. But um, it was important that, that Dan Carroll um, acknowledged that this uh, required greater support to, to flourish. Um, obviously, much of my career has been in delivering treatment interventions, and I've also had a, a real research interest in, in developing and evaluating psychosocial interventions. Um, I think back to my medical training in Oxford in the early 90s when um, evidence-based medicine was just coming into being and all the tools that, have, that we're now so familiar with were, were being uh, rolled out in medical training at that point. And that really has influenced my career in that not only do we need um, the best quality scientific evidence for, for our practice, but we also need to pay more attention to how um, particularly psychosocial interventions are delivered in practice and how we, we bridge that gap, as said before, from knowledge into action. And I, I really get behind that, that point as being crucial. Um, the sorts of initiatives that ISAP is, is driving are, are exactly what is needed. So, so clinicians ensuring that they are up to date, ensuring that they're, um, they have adequate supervision and, and, and that they understand how their practice can influence the wider service delivery. Um, the third element is, is, as my title suggests, very close to my heart. So, so I, I am quite passionate about the recovery orientated system of care. So thinking about um, the, the, the helping systems as being a, a whole spectrum of interventions. So in the heart of that might be professionally led treatment interventions, but that's of course one part of a recovery journey. Severe dependence requires uh, recovery. recovery is, a, is, a, is an individual process that takes a long time, involves a lot of effort, and it involves a lot of services that sit around um, professionally-led uh, in healthcare interventions. And these are now gradually coming under the rubric of, rec uh, of recovery support services. And there's a real evidence base led by um, esteemed colleagues like uh, John Kelly at, at Harvard, um, looking at the, 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 there's an increasing evidence base for these recovery support services. So things like, um, peer mentoring, um, uh, employment interventions, dry housing, um, uh, and, and interventions in universities. So um, um, I'm very much involved at the moment in developing um, uh, collegiate recovery programs in the UK as have flourished in, in, in the US. And as professionals, I think we need to really think about how we can get better at facilitating access to recovery support services and, and understanding the unique skills and, and um, uh, and, and abilities of people with lived experience of addiction. 
and, and, and ensuring that they receive parity of esteem in, in um, the wider treatment system. I just finished with a, with a reflection on your, your upcoming um, seminar because um, families have been a major part of my, my work down the years and I've been in part of a research group with Jim Orford and Alex Capello at the University of Birmingham which is really focused on social network and family interventions for addiction. I've been very involved in developing uh, social behaviour and network therapy for, um, for uh, people with drug problems particularly. Um, and I think now again we have a, a strong evidence base that there are interventions that, that, are, that are extremely effective at helping family members in their own right to cope with the stress that, that addiction in a loved one can cause. There are interventions that can help family members um, facilitate their loved one to get into treatment and of course there are interventions that involve family and social network members in that actual treatment and I think uh, practitioners uh, have a crucial part to play in, in ensuring that these are raised above the current level they're really not recognized they're always the first bit to, to be cut when uh, budgets get tight and fundamentally I believe addictions are disorder of the social environment um, it's often said that the opposite of addiction is connection and where does connection start most often? It's often the family and, and, the, and, the, um, and the closest people to you. So su substance use practices, practitioners really need to understand this, uh, this um, area in order to, to optimise their practice. So I'll finish there and, and wish you all the best for both the UK chapter and, and the remainder today. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. It's actually... Uh, you know, looking back of our 10-year dr tracking drugs to build a better uh, bridge and the 10-year drug strategy. So much work was done and, and so much later on were, were undone. So we are where, where we are um, and, and we need to move on. And I quite agree with you. We left recovery, family involvement off the agenda for so long. Um, but I'm glad this is now being recognized. Worldwide, not only UK, and this is across. And thank you so much for this again inspiring uh, presentation. And, and it's almost, um, almost like uh, wanting to say that we may need a webinar on this on, on itself, whole webinar to discuss the politics of, uh, of addictions and the recovery journey and how we bring this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, I am now going to close uh, this. Uh, sessions and we move on to part two of 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 of, of this uh, um, launch of this webinar and i will pass on to uh, dr ruth mcgovern from the university of newcastle who will introduce part two and chair part two thank you so much ruth for um, sharing this and we're going to look at family issues in this in this uh, side of the webinar over to you Ruth. thank you thank you Ralph. So yes, hello, my name is Ruth McGovern. I'm a, a lecturer in public health research at the University of Newcastle um, in the UK. I have a, a professional background in social work and humanistic counselling working in, um, in the drug and alcohol field um, for spanning around about 20 years, a little over. Um, and much of the work that I did in my practice life was very much focused on the individual the, the individual user of, of substances and often completely devoid of the family and any connection with the family and I really must say that um, in reflection that was to the expense of, um, of, of the practice of the support that we provided to the individual user. Since moving into research um, a number of years ago I've really begun to focus my work on the development and evaluation of, of family interventions both as a means of, of, of um, enabling the, the person who uses substances to make positive change um, within, the, within the relationships with their family or through the relationships with the family as a medium of support for them, but also providing care and support to family members who are affected by some of these substances in their own right um, in response to their own needs. So I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing a session um, with my colleagues today talking about this matter. I'd like to first of all introduce Viv Evans, um, OBE, um, who is the Chief Executive of ADFAM. Viv, I don't know if you'd like to, to put your camera on now um, as I, I proceed to, to introduce you. But ADFAM is a national organisation um, for children, families and friends affected by someone else's substance misuse and their gambling. 
Um, this got a long history of, of senior positions um, in the public and charity sector, all with a, a focus upon drug and alcohol education, prevention um, and treatment of, of children and families that are affected by substance use. And she has a lot of um, work within the policy arena also. She was a former member of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs and chaired the working group on the implementation of the report for the inquiry into children of, of problem drug users, the Hidden Harm Inquiry, with which those of you um, who are calling in from the UK will be very familiar with. Um, she's chaired the Drug Sector Skills Consortium funded by the Department of Health and the Family Drug and Alcohol Court Advisory Group. And she's also a board member of International Society of Substance Use Professionals, Children in England, Alcohol Change UK, amongst many other things that, that, that Viv does. And, and Viv's going to talk to us um, about the importance of supporting children and families who are affected by substance misuse and also talk to us a bit about the English government policy drivers. Over to you, Viv. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you for that um, golden introduction. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's great to be here today. And as you mentioned, I'm not only speaking I'm speaking on behalf of Adfam today, uh, but also as a board member of um, ISAP Global, and I'm also on the advisory group of the UK chapter. So delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted that we've um, that the UK chapter has got off the ground, and it's an exciting an exciting time in its development. Um, for those of you who don't know Adfam, uh, we're the leading national charity supporting families uh, and friends affected children, families and friends affected by substance misuse in England. And I'm very pleased that uh, my colleague um, north of the border. Uh, Justina, uh, Justina Murray will be will be speaking will, will be speaking after me. Uh, we do work together collaboratively, uh, but <clears throat> and there are some quite key differences I think between uh, approaches in Scotland and England, and we we learn from each other. Um, however, um, I'm actually speaking from the south of France, where it's very very warm. Um, but as you probably know, if you've heard the news. Um, the Brits and the Americans aren't too popular here at the moment, but anyway, um, I don't think that's going to get in get get in the way of our um, joint and collaborative effort to deal with the um, to to deal with substance misuse as a global as a global issue. Anyway, could I have the first chat um, the first slide, please? Um, a lot of you will know this. This is um, um, this is Gin Lane. Uh, by Hogarth, an illustrator, a painter in, uh, I think, um, 18th century Britain. And you'll see there that there's the mother in the middle of the painting, and she's been feeding her baby, but the baby has fallen off the breast because her mother is intoxicated. And I, my point here is this problem uh, of, of family members, children have been affected by drugs and alcohol for a long time. This is not <laughs> this is not a new phenomenon. Gonna have the next slide, please. And it's one that, in my, my view and Adfam's view, goes largely still unrecognized. Uh, this is Bruegel's um, picture of the fall of Icarus. If you can see, you may may not be able to, but if you look closely uh, down in the right hand corner of the um, of the painting. There's um, a couple of there's a leg splashing around. That's Icarus, who has fallen from the sky because he fell too close to the sun. And here is the uh, the guy with the oxen, and he's just walking by. He's not noticed that this has happened. And I think that that is so much the case, particularly around children um, affected by uh, parental substance misuse. They go unnoticed, um, not just in policy but in practice. And this is. I think our aim, and I'm so glad to be working with ISAP to change to change that perception and change that picture. Next one, please. Um, right, okay, that's obviously our royal family. Um, families come in all shapes and sizes, and they can look very happy, even if maybe they're not. Could I have the next one, please? Next slide. Um, and certainly when drugs and, and or alcohol are part of the picture in the family, um, that is often a recipe for for conflict, for disaster, 
there's the child there in the corner who doesn't want to look at what's going on um and it's um it, 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 this this is what happens and it happens in so many families and so many that we just we're just not touching the surface of this next one please uh, I, the other point I want to make is that you know, when sorrows come, not in not single spies, but in metal battalions, battalions. Um, so many families affected by substance misuse. It's not just substance misuse. There's mental ill health, domestic abuse, offending, homelessness. Um, it's a multi that they're. The, these family members have multiple needs, very often have multiple needs. And again, they're not being addressed. They're falling through the cracks of services far too often. Next slide, please. And uh, drug or alcohol use affects so many people. You'll see from the from our um, diagram there, threat children, immediate family, significant others, reaches right out to colleagues, right out into the community, to neighbors and associates. Um, so if we can work with a drug or alcohol user and have uh, the immediate family and friends to support that person, we're going to be able to create a ripple effect that we hope will have a positive impact and outcomes for a whole range of other people and community and our communities. Next slide, please. Um, last year we did, we commissioned a YouGov poll, or year before last, and we've just recommissioned it and it's coming up. Uh, the, the, the um, results aren't public yet, but they're coming up with more or less the same answers. One in three adults in the UK have been affected by the drug or alcohol use of someone they know at some point in their life. That's a lot of people. Can I have the next one, please? And one in 10 adults, that's about 5 million people, are currently, not in the past, but are currently struggling um, with uh, drug or alcohol use of someone they know. That is, again, a hell of a lot of people. Um, and we know that, OK, that, that even if um, they may not still be with the, the person with the problem, often the effects of that experience are that they can be lifelong. Uh, we know from our um, from all our supporters with lived experience that this is often the case. It's not a snapshot event. It doesn't just go away. Um, could I have the next one, please? Uh, lots of numbers here. Um, and I'm hopeless at maths and I always get the numbers wrong, but there are a lot. There are a lot of children living with parents who are drinking hazardly. Um, that child protection cases, over 50 percent of child protection cases that social workers are dealing with, alcohol misuse is identified as a factor. And the same as that huge number uh, on um, caseloads of uh, social workers, childcare cases. Um, about one third of domestic violence incidents are linked. They're linked to alcohol misuse and the figure of 250 to 350,000 children, that's the from hidden harm, um, are growing up with somebody with a, with a problem, uh, drug problem, not an alcohol problem. So there's a lot <laughs> and it's unrecognized in my view. Can I have the next slide, please? The impact of living with caring for being around somebody with a drug or alcohol problem is huge the impact on the family member on the loved one um social financial uh money being stolen for drugs or alcohol there are physical impacts so many of our family members say that they have to go to the gp they need prescriptions for anxiety often they have mental ill health uh, problems, there are psychological problems. I don't need to go into the links with criminality. Um, so the, the, all these the, these impacts are personal, and there and in, there's an impact on society too. Um, and stigma, which is an increasingly an issue of interest for researchers, and you know something that we've been talking about at Adfam for a long time. People who use uh, drugs problematically are often stigmatised by society, and so are their family members too. It's not just them. It seeps into the wider into the wider family. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, there are lots of case studies. I I won't read through those, and you have um, uh, you have James to to talk to you after me about his lived experience. But drug misuse tears families apart. I don't want to. Um, I'll, I'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, why are families important and 
why are people like me and Adfan banging on about it? Um, because if you involve a family, as Ed said, if you involve a family member in their loved one's treatment, you can all be well, you can get them into treatment and you help their recovery and so help them to sustain their recovery. So they have a role to play to support the substance user. However, uh, family members merit help in their own right. Um, not every family member wants to support their loved one for all sorts of reasons. And the impact of that, as I've just said, on their own physical and mental health uh, and well-being is huge and they need help in their own right. Um, and if we can get, but if we can get more parents, for example, into treatment, they can have positive, can have positive effects for the child. Um, and that's something that I'm very pa pa passionate about. Could we have the next slide, please? Um, and rebuild it. another reason to involve all families. Rebuilding those relationships is a key constituency uh, of recovery because they can provide family members provide vital recovery capital. If you have a home and if you have a job and if you have a relationship with a it, it, with a supportive relationship, your chances of recovery and sustaining that recovery are greater than if you hadn't. Um, and families know their loved one very, very well, they can help in that treatment process and help map routes away from dependency. Next one, please. Um, policy responses. Uh, you've heard about drug strategies in this country. Um, very little mention of families other than a passing glance, I would say. Um, and uh, you've heard from Ed about the disinvestment in the drug and alcohol uh, sector treatment over the last 10 years, 11 years. And that has also, um, th that's, um, that hasn't just meant um, treatment services, it meant support services for families. I came to ADFAM now nearly 20 years ago, perhaps too long, some people might say ago, but um, there were about 140, I think, local support groups of family members then, often set up by people with lived experience. Those of all, not all of them, there are a few left, but so many of them have either been taken over or just had to close down. Um, the Dame Carol Black report, um, we've written a big response to that because again, it mentions families as being very important, but is there gonna be any money to set up services and set up support for them? Uh, Hidden Harm was a key response that, and as uh, Ruth said, that was a big uh, report into um, impact of substance misuse on children and that has been taken note of um, again funding is the, is an issue um, there's a lot of interest in this in England on children and parenting um, rather than family members I think sometimes when politicians and uh, policy people decide um, families they mean parents and they mean the impact of children which is hugely important but we mustn't forget the impact on adult family members as well um, parental conflict um, government has invested in um, training and uh, projects that address parental conflict around particularly around alcohol issues and alcohol I don't know I mean I think alcohol is a huge far more people use alcohol than use drugs it's sometimes often neglected within certainly within drug strategy responses and it's not a feature it's not within the remit of the Dame Carol, Dame Carol Black report and yet we mustn't forget the impact that alcohol has on, on families it's absolutely massive um, I've mentioned funding and workforce it's at the bottom of my list but that doesn't mean to say that it's not actually that it shouldn't actually be on the top I think that um, the workforce across it's every children and families affected by substance misuse because of the figures we've seen is everybody's business it's every professionals and every practitioner's business um and um i hope we you know i'm so delighted to be working with isip to drive this agenda forward it's the work we need to train everybody to be aware of the issues around um, families and substance misuse next one please um, Ruth mentioned interventions and Ed mentioned interventions. Um, these are interventions that are um, uh, evidence-based, some that work with family members to promote entry and engagement of users into treatment, uh, some with joint involvement of family members and their relatives, 
Uh, we have to remember that sometimes family members do not want to engage with their loved one after a certain, um, you know, sometimes the damage and the pain, the, the damage is too great. Um, so interventions that are aimed to respond to the needs of family members in their own right, um, like um, Ed mentioned, um, the work that he'd done um these are this is another key intervention and that very much focuses on the family member in their own right without regard to um to the substance user the next slide please and as well as evidence-based interventions um there's peer support um peer support groups where people can like aa but uh, but others too facilitated peer su support groups information and community events there are helplines we have a um, a new service at adfam now called adfam at home which is a virtual counseling service there is befriending and there is mutual aid like uh, aa and na brother and al anon um so let's not forget that yes um interventions that are evidence-based are hugely important and the medical profession treatment professions we, we should take note of them but we mustn't diminish um the uh, the huge impact, I think, and the effort and the contribution that people with lived experience uh, make to um, helping support each other in this in, in this important sector. I think that might be the last one, actually. Is it? Next one, please. Ah, some key points to consider, and this is the last one. Uh, families need to recover too. It's not just all about the user. They need help. Um, they don't always recognize their own needs. They see themselves very much as a corollary of the user and don't think that they deserve help in their own right. And neither do they always want to be recovery capital. I've spoken to family members who say, well, what about me? I just don't want to be there just to support him or her. I need support for myself. Um, sometimes, yes, families can be part of the problem. And you'll know as well as me the number of um, uh, people whose children and then grandchildren, and this is where prevention is so vitally important, um, you know, children um, affected by substance misuse may well go on to become substance users themselves. We have to intervene to prevent that. I've mentioned stigma and shame. I mentioned that the family members feel they're not deserving of support, um, but we don't just want family services. We want more family services. That's what we campaign for. But we don't want them just to be an add on. And I think this comes back to our points about the workforce. Um, just because you're an extremely competent social worker, um, excuse me, or drug and alcohol treatment worker doesn't mean to say that you don't need to uh, that your um, uh, professional expertise doesn't need to be developed to be able to work with families. And a final point, um, because it's specialist, it's specialist work. Um, how do we support children through their parents' recovery? Um, often, yes, if parents change, they they become, they if they're in recovery, they won't be the same parent as they were. Things will change, family dynamics change. And I think we need to recognize that and make sure that families get that support when somebody is in recovery, because so often the dynamics of that family will change and they will need to recognise and work and and, um, uh, and uh, work with that. I think that might be the last one. Am I right? Is it the ne next slide? Yes. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, I hope. Yes, it is my last one. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, I've, I, ISIP's got a huge uh, role to play in um, supporting in supporting families and supporting the destigmatization of families and the need for families to get recognition and thank you Ruth because I know you share that ambition and thank you to everybody today for listening and for um, giving me the opportunity to uh, to I was going to say rabbit on because I know um, I know Justine is going to have a blether <laughs> <laughs> well it was very engaging rabbit on Viv as always <laughs> And I think, I think certainly whenever I listen to you speak, either formally or informally, what I'm always struck by is just how motivational you are um, and just how much you bring home how important this area of work is. So thank you for doing that again today. One of the thank other you. things that I'm really excited about about our webinar today is, is the fact that we've got um, two people who are, who are bringing um, to their presentations very clearly and very centrally their own personal experiences. I'm sure there's many people that are um, that are involved in practice 
um, that bring those experiences with them all of the time and who may be presenting for different reasons. But these particular speakers um, are both bringing very centrally their, their own personal experiences. And it, it brings me great pleasure to invite James um, to put on his camera and um, to, to begin his presentation. The thing about um, the thing that, that I am acutely aware of and, and every day become more aware, aware of is just how important it is for us to listen to um, the experiences of people who have who have lived the things that we're trying to respond to. And that is really important in how we develop and design and provide services. And it's also really important in research. Um, I have, um, I, I'm aware that James is going to present on his, um, his own experiences of receiving family support. But I guess his presentation is really his introduction. So I'm going to allow James to, to introduce himself through, through his talk. Thank you very much. Um, I would like this talk uh, to be about the word support a word I previously had little use for, and as such, little understanding of. Ten years ago, my then 17-year-old son, Ian, and I hope you may be able to see a photo of him and his sister behind me, started his roller coaster journey into substance abuse. A journey that started with a young man's drug experimentation, and then moved through to a place that had all the hallmarks of addiction, eventually leading on to acute psychosis and suicide attempts, before eventually his death by suicide last year. That, I'm afraid, may not be a cosy introduction to a talk, but I am not comfortable with elephants being in the room. Mm. I will not use this opportunity to regale you with my war stories from that time. I imagine many of you know that territory only too well. Suffice to say that along the way, there were several rehabs, psychiatrists, therapists, ambulances, policemen and hospitals. It was 10 years in which my family lost most of its savings and in which we cancelled innumerable holidays and social occasions, in which we found it hard to ever relax and concentrate on what had hitherto been our delightfully boring and normal life. A time when the whole 24 hour a day focus, emotionally, financially and practically, was on trying to help my son. And yet, it may surprise you to hear that I consider myself to be one of the lucky ones. Let me explain. It all started one day when my son's therapist wrote to me suggesting I myself consider support and recommended ADFAM. Please forgive my then arrogance, but as I read her email, I had no idea what she was talking about. I considered, I considered myself capable, emotionally sorted and independent. Sure, my son needed support, but how could that word possibly apply to me? However, it led a few days later to the front door of a drug drop-in centre in an economically deprived area of my city. A place where I had been given an appointment to meet someone called a family support worker. For me, as I saw myself at the time, a middle-aged, middle-class man of supposedly good character, this was both extremely confusing and humiliating. In my self-pity, I asked myself, what had I ever done to be in this position? My confusion was only to get worse, as I was then expected to understand a language that I was wholly unfamiliar with. I heard words like support worker, peer mentor, outreach centre, key worker, 
support group. Many of them phrases that I'd never heard before and that belonged in other people's lives, but not mine. Nevertheless, that first day was the start of a process where I learned the meaning and value of support, a concept that was to sustain and strengthen me in the difficult days that were to come. I had 12 sessions with that family worker where I learned about the value of keeping boundaries, about coping with conflict, about positive communication, avoiding enabling, and many, many other aspects of living with a loved one's chaotic behavior. In doing so, it felt I had stepped into a whole new world and a whole new field of expertise. But it also meant I started to become better able to objectively understand my son's behavior and how to respond to it for his benefit, and most importantly and primarily, for mine. The old story of putting on your oxygen mask in an aeroplane before you help with that of your children comes to mind. Later, I took some training and became what was known in our area as a family champion. The role involved using my experience of the awkwardness and difficulty of first accessing support to help others finding themselves in such a position. It meant working voluntarily at a drug drop-in centre to meet and listen to family members who are often making that first walk of shame. It involved offering them an unjudgmental ear, perhaps for the first time, and the chance to be signposted to what help was available to get them to consider support groups and to provide them with literature. Over the years, I got to see so many times that same level of helplessness and powerlessness that I had experienced. The sense of almost being on an alien planet with nowhere or no one to turn to. As much as anything, it gave me and them the chance to normalize our experiences and to share what were so often similar stories. The adage that a problem shared is a problem halved seemed so true. We shared in support groups where we could swap information and most importantly, have our experience of life validated and where shame and stigma were left at the door. Furthermore, it was a place where many friends were made. Those days made a strong impression on me and a realization that in fact, the whole aspect of support was probably the most important factor in improving the quality of our lives and perhaps consequentially, the opportunity and possibility for our loved ones to get better. Addiction is often called the family disease. And if that were so, it would seem that the family must also heal together. The possibility of change coming from the family dynamic as much as from the substance abuser. This was for me and so many of the people I met, the single most important takeaway, the biggest opportunity for change. My son, when he was alive and his mental health was sound, concurred that for him, the greatest help he received with his difficulties was not the rehabs and the experts that came his way, albeit they played their part, but it, it was when his family learned how to respond to his behavior with empathy as opposed to judgment, where he felt safe instead of frightened. A place where he knew his boundaries, even if he didn't much like them. A place where his family came to fully realize that there is no such thing as a happy addict. 
it seems to me that family support is even more crucial in the times we now find ourselves. It may be preaching to the converted, but in terms of context, can I offer a brief version of my own story of how I experienced our country's provision for mental health and addiction? A story that it is, in my opinion, is shared by many. In the years that my son struggled with poor mental health and addiction, it seemed I spent every waking minute trying to find him help. I was known in my work as being a bit of an expert problem solver. And so as I started out my, started out my quest, I didn't think it could be that difficult to get into the system and find answers and solutions. The truth, however, was that it was just one disappointment after another. Our GP offered very little help, knowledge or information. It was my opinion that he had very little training in addiction. Our local drug services seemed understaffed and in many respects had limited availability. Finally, when my son eventually found his way with a referral to our local acute psychiatric team, he was offered a level of care that was breathtaking in its ineffectiveness. After his death, the NHS conducted their own internal review of his case that contained 38 pages, each one damning in its findings of his care. None of the individual people involved along the way were bad people. Badly trained, badly managed, badly recruited, perhaps, but not bad people. But instead, maybe an illustration of how in my area, and perhaps others, mental health came across as an afterthought. In my own case, I was able to pay for private psychiatrists, therapists and rehabs, but I have enormous sympathy for the majority for whom this is not possible. My story might be an unlucky one or an extreme one. Maybe there are better providers in other parts of the country. But I use my story to emphasize the importance that the concepts of support gave me. In the face of this very limited help from the institutions of state, the education and structure I received from family support made such a difference to the difficulties that came my, came my way. It didn't make, make them necessarily easier, but it gave me a framework with which to operate and a resource to fall back on. It further changed me as a person. I came to see myself as part of a whole, as part of me being the whole. It led to me learning the gift of another's help and the joy of being able to offer my own. It helped me away from isolation to the beautiful world of connection. After my son died, that message of the value of support had one final unexpected and wondrous consequence. In the early days when addiction first came into our lives, my wife and daughter and myself found it hard to agree on anything. From being previously a close family, we'd all retreated into our own certainties of what the approach should be to my son's behavior. Eventually, we came to realize we were all wrong and through what we learned through family support, were able to change our dynamic. After Ian died, our daughter Emma came home to live, to live with us for three weeks, and we were all able to grieve together. We were all able to support each other. We took it in turns to cry each day until there were no more tears to cry. That wonderful little word, support, now fully understood. Thank you very much, James, for that incredibly moving and very open presentation. 
um, as somebody who spends a, a lot of time trying to work out what works for who under what circumstances and why that works, I'm always struck, and I was listening to you, by how it's actually the really simple things that seem to make the difference to people. The concern in the letter, that somebody who shows concern, a bit of care, a bit of humility, the non-judgmental approach, or the, you know, the, the listening ear of somebody who understands. Thank you very much for that. James has said that he would be prepared to answer any questions along with the other presenters and we do have a little bit of time at the end of our session today so if, if you have anything that you would like to be asked of James or the other presenters please pop those in the chat somebody is keeping an eye on them um, but once again thank you very much James. I'd now like to invite um, the last of our, our um, um, presenters um, Justina, Murray and Colin Hutchin to, to join. Um, hello both, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, Justina, um, I'll give you Justina's introduction. So Justina is the CEO of Scottish Families Affected by Alcohol and, and Drugs, which is a national charity which supports anyone concerned with somebody else's um, alcohol or drug use. Um, Justina joined the Scottish Families in, in 2017 after holding a, a, um, a wide range of, of senior positions um, trying to affect positive change within the local community in Scotland and also um, having impacts within um, in New Zealand also. And she's also got a PhD in social policy which she gained from the University of Glasgow and that was based on an exploratory study of models of empowerment in eight Scottish community development projects. She's on boards um, including the North um, Asia Women's Aid and Executive Governance Go Group, sorry, for the Children and Young People's Centre for Justice at the University of Strathclyde. And Colin, Colin has um, personal experiences which have, have convinced him of the need to extend support to families affected by a loved one substance use um, and their key roles in saving lives. After gaining many benefits himself from attending the support group, both him and his wife trained as smart recovery facilitators and have consequently established their own support group, which, which was established in 2015. Colin joined the Board of Scottish Families Affected by Alcohol and Drugs in 2017 and became the chair in 2019. And since the establishment of the Scottish Government's Drugs Death Task Force in 2019, Colin has been the family with lived experience representative on there and also chairs the Associated Family Reference Group. So again, we've got some, some incredibly experienced speakers who I'm going to hand over and they're going to have a blether. Um, a, blether about, <laughs> a blether about services and, and for those of you that are, are either not from Scotland or possibly the north of England, a blether is a conversation. A blether away. Thanks uh, so much Ruth and uh, before we get into our blether I just wanted to reflect it's very hard to follow on from James's presentation there on lots of levels really but um, in this blether, we're going to be really looking at family experiences um, across policy and practice as well. So hopefully it'll actually be a very natural flow on um, from James sharing his own, own experience there. So thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of the ISAP launch today. And it really is fantastic to see this focus on, on families um, and the chance for Colin and I to have this wee blether about families and substance use in Scotland. And Colin and I first met in May 2017 when I was being interviewed for what was then the interim CEO post at Scottish Families and Colin was one of the board members giving me a bit of a grilling um, and two and a half years later as Ruth mentioned he had the fortune or misfortune to become the chair of Scottish Families so probably never a week was passed now without some sort of contact between us not just about Scottish Families business but also the other hats that he wears as the family rep on the Drug Death Task Force and chair of the Family Reference Group. And today we're going to have the chance to talk about all of these kind of things as we chat about where things are for families affected by substance use in Scotland and how families are really trying to influence policy and practice here, um, as well as a look to the future. So let's get this blather started. Um, Colin, this is an international event today as we launch the UK chapter of ISIP. So lots of the people here won't necessarily be aware of what things are like for families affected by substance use in Scotland. And from your perspective, how would you describe the situation just now for families uh, in Scotland? Well, uh, can I just firstly say thanks to Viv and uh, James. Uh, for, I, you know, agree with everything they say. And I felt um, um, very strongly for it, James. 
very um, brave of him to actually share that story so recently after his bereavement. Actually, when I was thinking about this uh, today, I realised there's, there's people from about 80 different countries uh, attending this. So it, it's very much a kind of global audience. And what struck me was the kind of contrast between the image that uh, I would normally want to show people about what we call Bonnie Scotland. Uh, I'd be encouraging everybody, if you haven't been here, to come to Scotland. It's a beautiful country. But unfortunately, today we're talking about another side uh, of Scotland, the kind of dark side of Scotland, and which is um, defined actually by some shocking statistics, um, drug death statistics. Um, some people may be uh, familiar with these, maybe not, but uh, the last figures for 2020, there was 1,339 people died from a substance use, uh, from drug use, sorry, uh, in Scotland. And that represents a very high kind of percentage of the population. There's only five and a bit million people in Scotland. We're not a big country. And these numbers have been increasing since 1996. So it's, it's not something new, really. And there's been a steep increase since 2013. So now we are recognised as having the worst figures in Europe by a long way. Uh, and it's hard to explain um, why we've you know, reached that uh, position, but it's a fact. Um, and you can look back at Scotland's history, I suppose, and you could say there's parts of Scotland that we would have been identified as being described as industrial areas. Um, shipbuilding and all sorts of factories and um, construction and so on. And a lot of that disappeared. Like in other countries as well, it's happened. Um, and even then, when there was high employment, um, parts of Scotland had a reputation for hard drinking um, and violence. Um, and we've been struggling to deal with these kind of issues for a long time. But then what came along really was, was drugs. So Families, um, you know, I mean, you could look at the, the, the consequence, I suppose, of the, the, the big uh, employers disappearing from Scotland. It did create a lot of unemployment, which brings poverty, deprivation, poor health generally, and then generations of people growing up in these circumstances. And I've heard some people saying, if you lived in these circumstances, the question is, why would you not use drugs rather than why do they use drugs? Because their life seems um, a bit pointless and, and they've got no future to, um, to look forward to. But it's not the whole picture either, because actually there are many, many families affected by a loved one's substance use, but it's, they're from all parts of the country, not just the post-industrial parts of the country. Um, and you know, my family's one of them. Um, we didn't live in that sort of situation. It's quite a kind of middle class area that we live in here. And our problem started with uh, one of our sons uh, when he was a teenager about 25 years ago. Um, and he's still a kind of work in progress, I suppose, but he's doing well today. But say there are many families affected all across the country. And they are largely, as, as Viv was saying earlier, they're largely invisible and unsupported. Um, and it has a big impact, as we know, um, on their mental health and sometimes their physical health as well. And that's despite the great efforts of organisations like Scottish Families Affected by uh, Alcohol and Drugs, um, that I'm proud to be the chair of. And there are some other charities and services that provide some support, but there's just not nearly enough. And of course, families are living with um, anxiety, frustration, feeling helpless, as James said, angry, desperate sometimes. And and they feel alone with that. And that's probably the worst thing, um, because it's like a secret suffering. You mm. can't share it with people. You don't want to tell the rest of the family. You don't want to talk to your neighbours about it. So you just hold it all inside, and it's, it's very destructive. So what made a difference to me and my wife um, was family support. Um, it's as simple as that. That didn't cost us any money. Um, it just makes such a difference. Um, but the reason that not enough people 
gain the benefits of family support is there's two reasons. One is there isn't enough of it to go around everybody. But secondly, it's a stigma, which has been mentioned today already, um, because they feel ashamed and embarrassed and, and all the rest of it. And, and also, they just don't think um, that it's me that needs help. As James was saying about support, you know, if, if my son gets himself sorted out, we'll be fine. Uh, and I, I didn't realise at that time that um, that was wrong. Um, we needed to get ourselves sorted out and if we're going to, you know, continue to support them in a kind of effective way. So we learn so much from family support. Um, and, I, and I just wish that more families in Scotland uh, today could access family support wherever they live. Um, there's there's so many things. I was I was gonna say there's so many things that you've touched on there. And I mean at Scottish families, we know that most families are hidden and we kind of start from that point of view. But just as you say as well, you know, we emphasize there's no one type of family, you know, and I hear services say, Oh, we know all these families, we know all the families, you know, and you're like, No, you don't, because most of them are hidden. And from Scottish families, we support families from every single corner of Scotland, you know, rural, island and urban communities um, and all different social groupings. So I think that's such an important thing to encourage people to come forward as well as not to put families in a box and say, oh, you are that type of family. But just as you're saying, it's, it's you know, affects everybody. We're, we're all jo Tam Tamsin's bairns, to say another uh, Scottish phrase. And You've, you've been in maybe an unusual position in terms of um, accessing family support for a start because we know that you know so many families don't um, but also you've had the opportunity to really play a role in sort of influencing policy and practice you know not just through Scottish families but also being the sole family rep on the drug death task force and also um, the earlier partnership for action on drugs in Scotland or PADS which has, has now been replaced by other mechanisms but, you know, how has that experience been? And do you really think families in Scotland are getting that chance to feed into policy and practice? Yeah, um, yeah, it sounds uh, strange when you mention all these things, but uh, it's certainly not how I planned to spend my retirement years, that's for sure. <laughs> and actually, I tend to blame my wife for it. Um, I will say she pushed me into it. What I really mean by that was that when we first went to family support group, um, the first time my son was going into rehab, it was because I recognised how serious the impact was on her. Rather, I must have been the, the man, I think, and just think I'll carry on my work and everything. Didn't really want to acknowledge how it was impacting on me. But I could see how it was impacting her. So um, I, I took her along to family support group. And then everything just kind of flowed from there. And, and I've gradually got more involved in all sorts of things. Um, support groups and events and organisations and, and some of that has been very challenging for sure um, but generally I mean it's been it's been very interesting uh, I've learned a lot I've learned a huge amount actually through connections with other family members and practitioners and spending more time with them than I ever thought I would uh, recently and people with lived experience and the Scottish Government um, because for I'm operating at that kind of level now and sometimes I feel a heavier responsibility because as you say I am the family's representative on the task force but I'm the only one um, so it's really important that I keep in touch with other family members and uh, know how they're feeling and what the latest issues are um, and I was okay I was glad you know that there was a family representative on the task force when they set up but uh, as you know we did argue that there should be more than one um, but we didn't get it, um, so we just have to be thankful, I suppose, for what we've got. But you know, sometimes it feels like—I so was going to say—sometimes it feels like we've got to let off our cats and say thank you very much for giving us that little seat on the on the task force. But um, I suppose making the most of the the opportunity. But I, I was wondering, you know, it seems to me that now government and others are listening to families and other people with lived experience more. There's definitely more platforms, there's even more chance to have a voice but do you feel things are changing more as a result you know and you're actually having an impact yeah i, I definitely think the political climate uh, is changing um, but these things change very slowly um, they don't change fast enough for most people's liking um, but you can see evidence of it in in different places but of course where you know i'm talking about like the the most recent scottish government's 
strategy um, on drugs, which was you know rights, respect, recovery, and uh, and you can see in some of the developments and initiatives that are coming out of the task force as well that there's there's usually, um, if I have my say, there's always um, some recognition of a need to include support families, which may not have happened if we hadn't been there shouting for it all the time. But you know I do understand as well uh, that people are not going to be terribly impressed by documents um, that mention families. What they're really concerned about is what actually happens. You know, in my town, in my village, in our area, how do we get help and support? How do we encourage people? How do we reach out to people and make them feel comfortable about, um, you know, seeking support? And that, I think that remains a challenge, uh, and it probably will do for some for some time. And I think what I'm always talking about now at the task force is um, what Ed Days mentioned particularly earlier on there, which is about family inclusive practice and all the benefits that brings. You know, and it's good to know that, that lots of people know that and they share that information widely. So it's not like we're really talking about something that nobody's ever heard of before. It's been around a long time, but it's just to recognise how it's a, it's a kind of win-win, I always say, that we involve families, you help them, they can help loved ones and you, you get the outcome, I suppose, that you, you're hoping for. A much better chance if families are involved. We've got so many um, good things written down on paper. I think, you know, I mean, you mentioned rights, respect and recovery and there's quality principles and so on that commit to family inclusive practice and families being supported in their own right. But, you know, we can't always see enough of it, just as you're saying, like on the ground for families. They're not always feeling the and seeing these things that are written down on on paper. So I think we're probably nearly out of time, but just quickly, you know, what do you think the future is going to be like for, for families affected by substance use in Scotland? Which which way are we heading, do you think? Well, I, I certainly hope that we're heading for um, a, a better um, situation, which is more inclusive for families and people recognise the impact that's having on them and the role that they can play, the positive role they can play in, in reducing. Um, we'll never get rid of uh, deaths, I don't think, sadly, but in reducing the number of um, fatalities. And they, you know, fundamentally, they and their loved ones need to be treated with compassion, respect, um, rather than what they've often experienced, which is disrespect, um, blame, derision within their communities and so on. That has to change, and that's the whole stigma thing again. But people just need to, you know, treat them as you would if it was some other kind of illness and, and be sympathetic, be compassionate. Um, and they won't maybe then suffer so much as people have done in the past because they won't have to remain silent about it. That's what I hope anyway for the future. And, and a bit like Glasgow buses, it feels like, you know, you wait ages for some funding to come along and then there's a, a kind of rush, rush of funding. And actually there's at least three large scale funds now available to support families, including families supported, uh, affected by substance use. So I, I think the, the money is more likely to be there um, it'll take some work to kind of get it into the right places and so on. But, uh, you know, I agree with you. A lot of the changes that need to make around treating people with dignity and respect and, you know, picking up the phone when, when you contact a service about your loved one, these are not things that cost any money um, and, and there, there doesn't need to be any delay in, in, um, in introducing these things. Well, Colin, I think that's probably the end of our wee blether because I know you and I can blether ad infinitum, um, but we're, we're on a clock today. So um, thanks again for the chance to be part of this today. We are on a clock and apologies though for, for, for photo bombing, camera bombing your presentation. I was checking for the questions in chat and accidentally clumsily pressed the wrong button. So apologies on that, hope I wasn't too distracted. <laughs> Did we disappear Gosh, again? Oh, we've go. lost your volume, I think, Marsh. I have you. My volume is... There you go. You got... Can you hear me now? Yes. You can hear me. I was just going to say, well, thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you very much to the uh, speakers. Um, and this, this is very topical. And... Uh, Major changes for me, you know, should happen at policy commissioning level uh, to ensure that, you know, family uh, is part of that uh, process, which to, to help to transform and redesign services 
some other countries have it. We started here very well now with users. There's a requirement for users to be part of the uh, commissioning and contracting process and I think families should be. So, you know, it's one thing to work with, with, with the community, to look at community engagement, to work with services, but we need that uh, empowerment from commissioning to make the changes and that's, that's my view. But thank you very much. It's been a great day today. And um, before we go on to question and answers, I, uh, I forgot you know, and we need to show the, the welcoming videos and apologies to those countries which should have shown that at the beginning. So could we um, show the videos, uh, Olivia, if you, if you got them? Olá, amigos do Capítulo Nacional do Reino Unido. Aqui é Paulo Martelli do Capítulo Nacional do Brasil, do Exup Brasil, o seu parceiro junto com todos os capítulos nacionais do mundo. Quero desejar uma boa sorte para o início de trabalho que vocês estão fazendo aí no Reino Unido, que é um trabalho muito importante, porque é um trabalho que ajuda a salvar vidas. Todas essas informações e capacitações baseadas em evidência científica. Mais uma vez, o Brasil se coloca à disposição de vocês para o que for necessário para ajudar nesse trabalho maravilhoso e deseja uma boa sorte no início das atividades do Capítulo Nacional do Reino Unido. Fiquem com Deus. Estimados amigos e colegas do Reino Unido, quero dar a nome do Capítulo Aiso do Equador, a mais cordial bem-vinda a esta família, esperando que tenham todo o éxito que se han planteado, poniendo à disposição os profissionais de ISO do Equador e esperando que pronto tenhamos a oportunidade de fazer trabalhos conjuntos na redução da de demanda. Bem-vindos e sorte em seu trabalho. Dear friends and colleagues in the UK, on behalf of the Greek chapter of the International Society of Substance Use Professionals, I would like to welcome you to the family and I would like also to congratulate you for uh, launching uh, your national chapter. We are looking forward to working with you on the fields of prevention, treatment and harm, harm reduction to strengthen our ties in Europe and worldwide. Welcome to our family. Carlos Irdades Nicoyenia. Hello, brothers and sisters from the United Kingdom. We from the ISAP National Chapter in Kenya are indeed excited as we congratulate you as an incoming new member of ISAP National Chapters. Our country, Kenya, situated on the equator in the beautiful continent of Africa, has a long standing history with the United Kingdom. We have a rich shared history and are members of the Commonwealth of Nations. It gives me much pleasure, therefore, and on behalf of ISAP Kenya, to I welcome you on board. We believe we shall enrich each other from our individual experiences in drug demand reduction by building a professional global workforce. Karibuni. Asante Sana. Good day, everyone. My name is Martin Agoje. I am the national president of ISOP Nigeria chapter. I am also a member of the board of directors of ISOP Global. On behalf of hundreds of members of ISOP Nigeria chapter, I welcome you to the ISOP family today. And we rejoice with you over the launch of uh, ISOP UK uh, today. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with you in different uh, areas. Uh, what is very important in this field of substance use prevention, treatment, recovery, and policy is collaboration. Uh, let's look at areas that we can work together. Uh, you can visit uh, uh, ISOP website and look at ISOP Nigeria chapter uh, corner and see the different activities that uh, we've been carrying out. You can also join our bi-monthly webinar 
uh, as well as uh, find time to read our uh, earlier uh, edition or previous editions of uh, ISOP uh, news uh, uh, letter tagged uh, Solis. So let's see how we can work together as we uh, uh, rejoice with you and congratulate you on this launch of uh, ISOP uh, uh, UK today. So once again, greetings from Nigeria and congratulations as you continue in the good work and continue in this uh, collaboration with other national uh, chapters across the globe. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brazil. Thank you, Ecuador. Thank you, Greece. Thank you, Kenya. And thank you, Nigeria. Um, we're coming towards the end of, of, of the uh, launch and in the webinar. We now come to question and answers. Um, do we, I don't have them on my screen, Olivia. Or, I have them. Or you have them. I have the questions, yep. yes. Okay. Could I maybe invite the speakers to, to put the cameras on at this point? Lovely, thank you. Um, so the first question, which is is directed at all the panel, but possibly um, Viv and Justine, this might be one that you choose to, to respond to. Can you give some more examples of interventions and initiatives that can be used with affected families to help their recovery, stress and suffering? Viv, do you want to try for that one first? Um, I mean, of the evidence-based um, interventions, there's craft, community rehabilitation and family training, I think Justine is called, craft, and which involves, that's about involving the whole family. Um, and then the other one I know is five step. Yeah. Five step, yeah. but that is, that is very much focused on the family member. Um, and then the smart recovery, which is a version of, um, would that be a version of 12 step? 12 step approach, I think. Um, no, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm oh. showing my the ones that I know best is craft and um, and five step. Five. But Tina, I'll, I'll make a general point before Colin knows more about um, smart than, than I do. In Scottish families, we use mostly craft, community, community reinforcement, and family training. But all of those examples that they've talked about are evidence-based interventions that change. It's about changing the situation. And I think that's where kind of evidence-based work with families really um, shifts from kind of friendship groups or, or groups which are just about supporting each other and you know sharing each other's stories. And, and those have an important function as well. But the work that we do as Scottish families, it's very much supporting families to um, to understand really what's happening and to make changes in their own life that they have control um, over. But um, Colin, do you want to say something about, I know um, Smart Family and Friends is more your bag. Yeah, um, my wife and I, as we said earlier, we trained as facilitators um, for um, Smart Recovery. So uh, it's not very common, let's say, for there to be a peer-led Smart Recovery group, but we found it really, really helpful. Um, and so did any of the, uh, the family members that came to our group. Um, and it's a, a, it's based on craft, really, you know. So, and it was there was a smart recovery um, program that came from America. It's been around for quite a while, anyway. And then they just devised a program specifically for family and friends. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think uh, my personal view is it is more effective to have some kind of structure within a support group, um, which leads to, as Justine says, change, because that's what really people are needing. Um, we don't have solutions to all their problems, but you know they can make changes. And James referred to some of these things earlier on as well, about learning about boundaries and how to communicate better and, and, and things like that. And uh, Craft and Smart both do that um, very, very well. Yeah, and uh, just to say, James, you referred to our the information and skills sessions. I think that you attended, which is a really a, a facilitated 
a facilitated group and um i think i we would all agree that the contribution that those groups make to the other tools in the box of um smart and craft um are extremely extremely valuable and i think it's often it's for family members to find their the the approach that suits them yeah you know it's it's for you which one suits you it may not be the same as somebody else may not even be the same as your partner or somebody else in your family but it's whatever suits suits you the approach that you feel comfortable with and helps you sure so it also in response to this particular question um i've asked joanna um if she can um post a link to a paper that Viv and I actually co-authored, um, and that's going to be placed on the online forum, um, which is moderated by Adfam called it called Supporting Families. And that particular paper, Viv, myself, and, and a, a range of other colleagues reviewed um, the um, academic evidence of a wide range of interventions that are um, are used to promote the, the health, social, and psychological well-being of families that are affected by uh, um, an adult um, who uses substances. And that particular paper, what we found was there's broadly three different types of interventions. So there was interventions which were for the family only that didn't include um, the, the, the substance user. But the point in that intervention was about helping that family to develop the skills to influence the substance user's behavior. And that's broadly the, the approaches which is which such as craft, uni, unilateral interventions we refer to them as. The other interventions are interventions which bring in family members um, in order to, to support um, the, the substance user and they, they get the interventions together in order to, to support the substance user to change. And those interventions tend to assume that the, the family is part of the problem, if you like, rather than part of the solution. And if you address some of those underlying problems, it will help the family, but particularly the substance user, make changes. The other types of interventions we found, and I think we, a number of us have advocated for these today, are those interventions that seek to benefit the family for the family's needs. And those are your psychological support of interventions. So the kind of interventions that, that James, I guess, talked about has been really important for, for him and his family. And they're very much about what does the family need and the five steps approach would very definitely fit into that one where it's, it's looking at the, the impact on the family. But if you're interested in looking at that more, then, then, then please do access that paper which is on the forum. The next question which I guess is, is directed um, at um, people with, with, with more experience, I guess, um, of this personally, is how do we share that concept, that idea that addiction is a family disease? How do we share that concept with other families, members, um, and other friends, either that, that we're connected to, or maybe out there, <laughs> and help people understand that this is something that, that maybe they could get support with too. So maybe that's directed more to James and Colin in the, initially. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that's a million dollar question maybe, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can tell by the, you know, the hesitation. That's such a difficult thing. I, I, I said that um, when I was speaking earlier that reaching families is is difficult um for a whole range of reasons um most people are not thinking about looking for support uh, for themselves so how you change that is is quite a challenge um but i think the only way is by more people being open and honest about their experiences because I, i'm pretty convinced that you know if I was in some social situation and, and I started to kind of share with people my experiences, there would be other people in that group, whichever group it is, who would be thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't realise that. And actually, it's, it's, it's me he's talking about, you know, because that's what you find when you go to a support group. You hear other people talking and you think they're actually describing my experiences because we're all experiencing the same sort of thing in slightly different ways and that's the great thing the greatest thing about a support group is it just takes away that feeling you're the only ones that are experiencing that because you've not been sharing it you're scared to tell people about what's actually going. and also i think to be fair families usually think this is going to go away so why would i tell everybody about it and cause all this fuss you know because it'll go away you'll, you'll be okay soon um and sadly, that's you know rarely the case. James, would you like to add to that? 
I think the, the, the hard thing is getting getting families into the support groups uh, in the first place. Once they're in a support group, I think that's that they're already halfway there. Not that it's going to solve anything, but it's certainly going to make their life more manageable. But how do you persuade them to actually go? When I was working in a drug drop-in centre and introducing myself for the first time as somebody who could give a listening ear and maybe help, I would say nine times out of ten, the people I was speaking to initially said, I don't want to talk to you. And my the skill that I, I like to think I developed over time was how to um, make myself seem so friendly and so persistent that they eventually did decide to listen to me. But it was just so, so often the case that they didn't want to acknowledge what was going on. And their level of shame was so high that they were doing anything rather than recognizing that. I mean, I, I, one thing, I, I mean, I'm not any good at practical solutions, but it, it would seem to me that a lot of people must end up at a GP somewhere along their journey. And the GP was educated to recognize the importance of family. He may well have the opportunity to, to steer them in an appropriate direction, as opposed to, as I just got given a leaflet and told that there's an address down the road you might want to go to. But it, it, if that GP had had some information or knowledge, it may well have led to a, a quicker resolution, quicker time for me ending up in a support group. But as I say, I'm not, I don't see myself as somebody with any great practical solutions. Um, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's so a good I, idea, James, actually, that one about the, the GPs. I, I've actually had um, meetings, discussions with trainee GPs about that very point that there's a there's an opportunity when people come into their surgery and usually complaining about all sorts of other problems, sleeplessness, headaches, uh, anxiety, and so on. And they're prescribed medication, ironically enough, um, which they might become dependent on, but they never really get to the root of the problem because they won't tell them. The patient won't say, it's actually because my son or my daughter or my partner has got a serious problem with um, a substance. So there's an opportunity there and what we were saying to the GPs was, apart from, there's a problem that we used to put, my wife and I, we had a support group, we used to put posters up, uh, things like that, but we had a big struggle doing that because a lot of medical centres said, oh no, if it's not NHS, you can't display posters here. And we thought that was particularly unhelpful in the circumstances, because yeah. we were trying to explain to them, we could actually reduce your workload here, because if these family members find a support group, they won't be coming to your surgery so often. There's a, there is a real problem there, but what we actually said to GPs was rather than giving them a leaflet, what might be better is if you say to them, would you mind if I gave your phone number to someone who will phone you? Oh, and that yeah. way you make contact with them much quicker. Because more people look at that leaflet and then they'll just put it down and think, nah, I'll not do that. So that's one way of overcoming that is just allowing that. that first step. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question, but it's going to be directed at everybody. And if I could ask you, because we are running out of time, so if I could ask you to answer quite succinctly, um, but each to give your own opinion. So we've had a really interesting question about how do we make use, make sure the new money is used wisely. So if you were, if you were given a little pot, what would you vote <laughs> to spend your money on? And I'm going to start with Justina and go around the screen in, in the order I see people. And Raj, would you like the input to this or would you like the pass? Um, it's 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 like a kind of rewind and and play question because this kind of funding came before you know uh, and uh, you know if I was given that, that that amount of money I think the first thing that I would want to do is right at the beginning when people come to our door whether we are at GP surgery or whether we are services is to develop that comprehensive assessment system. Yeah where we engage family yeah if you do it at every port of entry you're making changes you're engaging people yeah and uh, engaging families and i have seen this done uh, in, in many many uh, other parts of the world where through lack of resources family actually by default become more involved in the caring of their loved ones yeah and they make a huge difference if you you know, I can name those countries. I've been to about 25, 30 countries doing training for you and ODC. And I have seen <clears throat> this. So to me, the question is, you can have one million pounds, two million pounds money 
in itself doesn't make much of a difference. It's about how we change mindset. I've always said that resources are looking at us. The obvious is in front of us, but we look somewhere else in terms of currency. So without that money, we can't make change. We should be able to make change from our heart. Professional needs to start using their EQ more, talk with their heart more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then we will make the difference. And we've seen this. I mentioned this earlier on to a, a, a day. We had a 10-year drug strategy tackling drugs together, which covered the biopsychosocial aspect of addictions. Everything's on recovery and journey to more family, everything. Yeah. And uh, what happened after that? Yeah, you, you can't blame anything, but this is the nature of politics. All the work was undone, and now we're having to, you know recuperate and, re and do them again. I mean, Viva and I know about this. We've been on, uh, you look at hidden harm, you look at a whole range of other things on the ACMD. Uh, and uh, so to so come back to your question, very, very briefly, I'm conscious of time. For me, yeah. money is not the issue. <laughs> Thank you. Justina, would you like to give your very brief response to the, the, the voting? We have got this real opportunity in Scotland with a lot of new money being announced for families. And one of the positive things about that is there's lots of chat about it being a whole family approach. So we're quite clear that means making sure that children and young people and adult family members have their needs met, not necessarily in the same way at the same time, but they're all they're all supported in a way which suits them. Yeah, thank you. James, what would you spend the money on? Well, um, when my son used to go to uh, drug services, it always occurred to me that he used to go, he had, a, I think, an appointment for an hour a week. I can't remember. But if it was an hour a week, probably was, he would then come back and spend the next 23 hours in my house and th the following six days, 24 hours in my house. So it seemed to me that the chance that his family, or my, in this case me, had to have an impact on his life was massive compared to the one hour he had with the drug professional. And and if I had been well educated, and I, for the first three or four years of his story, I wasn't and probably made every mistake that was out there. When I became better educated, I like to think anyhow, I, I was able to offer a much better environment for him to get better. So in answer to your question, I would think in a cost effective way, it's much, much more cost effective to have families um educated and supported and you'll get more bang for your buck by doing that than you would with a lot of other interventions absolutely colin would you like to give your opinion uh, yeah i agree with everything that's the previous speakers have said um and i think what i'm seeing sadly actually there is a lot of money um that scottish government are putting up now um but a lot of that has been used to fill in gaps um, that have been created over the last 10 years or so, as you know, Roy was, was saying. So that's a pity, you know, that we're not really making a big step forward, we're just filling in gaps. But I think what I'm also learning is what's really important is that if we're going to make changes and invest in the changes, then they, the, the changes have to be based on evidence. Um, and there is a lot of that going on, to be fair. But it just, the, the problem with that is it takes time. But it has to be evidence-based. You know, this, this works somewhere else, and it's working there, working there. It can help here. That's desperately what Scotland needs. Thank you. And Viv, from what was looking like a very beautifully sunny room, <laughs> with a lovely dragon fan blowing in. <laughs> what I, agree. I agree with what everybody said. I mean, I also say, oh, if only. Uh, I'm madly envious of the money that's and it's great that that money is going in in Scotland. Uh, so far here, I've not seen any evidence of that. Um, but I do think we need uh, systemic change that's across all sectors. Workforce is a key issue. Why is it so important? Um, we need systemic change, and we we in England we need to continue to try and influence commissioners for example, so they don't see family support as just an add-on that they think, oh, there's exactly. a few things here, well, you know, let's just, you know, give a bit of family support. It needs to be, I think, you know, James referred to it, this needs to change across the whole system and needs to be recognised as deserving of um, yeah. of support. In the same way that, you know, and talk about it, in the same way we can now talk about mental ill health, can't we, thank goodness? We need that same seismic change around that. 
family substance misuse sector. Yes. Absolutely. And I think I'd spend the money on a train ticket to Bonnie Scotland to go and be part of the whole family approach that's planned there, because that would definitely be definitely be my <laughs> Right then, well, well, thank you very much for a really, really fascinating um, webinar and I've really enjoyed each of your individual talks, but also I've, I've very much enjoyed the discussion that we've managed to just about squeeze in afterwards. Raj, should I hand over to you to close? Yes, yes, and thank you very much to all of you and thank you to all our previous uh, speakers and thank you to Joanna. We lost, Carmel had to leave earlier on, so I just wanted to mention this but thank you to brian and thank you to ed who's, who's not who's already left and thank you to uh, to nick from middlesex university and thank you to all the participants around the around the world or from those 70 countries who uh, uh, you know gave us the privilege uh, uh, to actually share this platform uh, with them so thank you all and uh, we as i said this these sessions will be uh, recorded we have a number of other webinars uh, in the pipeline uh, around quality and family is one of the key areas which we are going to push for uh, because we have so many champions now within this ICIP or believers in, in not only believers but who believe in the evidence that for every drug user in his family who you 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 help it makes a huge difference uh, in terms of societal gains um so yes so thank you uh, very much so have a good uh, evening yeah and um, see you next time thank you bye okay, everybody bye. Thank, you. thank you take care thank bye you. now bye. 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 Bye.